So the next section, 10.2, is about comparing two means. Last section was two proportions. Now we're going to look at two means uh, like mu1 minus mu2. And remember, those are population parameters, right? The true mean from the first one compared to the true mean from the second one. The first part here says what is meant by the sampling distribution of the difference between two means. So similar to what we said for proportions, that describes the possible values of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So what types of values could we get if we compare our two sample means and how often they occur? And for an illustration of that, just look at the bottom of the page, right? That normal distribution, that's what we build all these inference methods on. So whether we use uh, a confidence interval, right, or a significance test, we use like the t-distribution, or for proportions, we'll use the normal distribution. It's all built on the sampling distribution. And you can see that at the bottom of the page. Okay, so the next part here, what are the shape, center, and spread of the sampling distribution? Are there any conditions? So in the box here, titled the sampling distribution of the difference between sample means, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So in the box here, it starts out giving the characteristics about the first population and the second population. The shape, well, if you look at the illustration, hopefully it's about normal, right? So we can say approximately normal if both sample sizes are bigger than 30. That's by the central limit theorem, CLT. So that's the condition that goes with normality. The central limit theorem says that if both sample sizes are bigger than 30, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. What if the sample sizes are small, though? There is a way around this. So the way around it is if the sample sizes are less than 30, we can still do inference. We can still assume, nor assume normality if the distributions for the parents are normal. So if the parent populations, and I put big N1 and big N2, if those are both normal, that's a way that we can get around that sample size requirement. And if you'll remember in the past, sometimes that required us to go ahead and plot the sample data for small sample sizes. So at least one of those has to be true for us to assume that the shape is approximately normal. So we've got the shape. How about the center? So the center of the distribution, we're talking about the mean. So the notation would be mu with a little subscript of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. And for that, we would just subtract the two population means. So the center would be pretty much where you would expect it. Uh, you do mu1 minus mu2. So you subtract the mean from the second population from the first population. Uh, there isn't a specific condition that goes with this. Uh, just know that this actually relies on that randomness condition. So we've got the normality. This one actually goes with the randomness condition. And then the spread of the distribution actually relies on the independence condition. And remember, we measure spread with standard deviation. So the notation for that would be sigma. And in the subscript, you have the x bar 1 minus x bar 2. And then we're going to do the square root of the standard deviation from the first one squared over the sample size from the first population and the standard deviation of the second one squared over the sample size from the second group. And just as a reminder, the independence condition is what this formula relies on. So as long as we have the independence condition, which typically we use 10%, then this formula is all good. So we've got the shape, center, and spread. And really, that's why we take the time when we're doing inference in the plan step to meet each condition. Right? We've got the normality condition, the independence condition, and the mean actually relies on the randomness condition. All right, and here you can see it illustrated. Every single one of these dots would be a value of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. The mean would be at mu 1 minus mu 2. 
whatever those true population means are, subtracted. And there's our standard deviation. If you'll remember, we typically use a simulation approach to make these, right? To try to illustrate every possible dot, every possible difference that we could get for x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So for our sampling distribution for x bar 1 minus x bar 2, the shape is approximately normal. The center, the mean here would be mu 1 minus mu 2. That's where that green line's at. And then the spread measured in standard deviation is right here. So the one example in these notes is about potato chips. It says a potato chip manufacturer buys potatoes from two different suppliers, Riderwood Farms and Camberley Incorporated. The weights of potatoes from Riderwood Farms are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 175 grams and a standard deviation of 25 grams. The weights of potatoes from Camberley are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 180 grams and a standard deviation of 30 grams. When shipments arrive at the factory, inspectors randomly select a sample of 20 potatoes from each shipment and weigh them. Let X bar sub C minus X bar sub R be the difference in the sample mean weight of potatoes from the two suppliers. Part A, what is the shape of the sampling distribution of X bar sub C minus X bar sub R? and why. So the sample sizes, 20 from each, wouldn't be big enough to use the CLT, right? Central limit theorem wouldn't apply here because the sample size would be less than 30 for each one. But if you read the problem, it says the parent populations are normally distributed for both. So that's really the key here. The sample sizes aren't big enough, but we can say since both population distributions are approximately normal, which is what it says in the problem. The sampling distribution is going to be approximately normal. So I know the sample sizes were small for each one, but since the parent populations were normal, we were given that. That means the sampling distribution, all those different sample means when we subtract them, is going to be approximately normal. Okay, how about the mean? So the mean would just be subtracting the two population means. So the mean of the sampling distribution, and here's the notation, mu, and then our x bar is subtracted in the subscript here. So the mean of our sampling distribution, we would just subtract the mean from Camberley minus the mean from Riderwood, so that gives us 5 grams. And then the standard deviation, let's not forget there's a certain condition we have to meet for standard deviation. Right? In this case, we'd be sampling potatoes without replacement, so we'd have to say something about the 10% condition and why that works. Well, since 20 potatoes is definitely less than 10% of each shipment, the 10% condition is all good. So we can use this formula for the standard deviation, which is a big square root. And then we do the standard deviation from the first one squared over 20, the sample size, plus the standard deviation from the second one squared. And 20 was the sample size for that one also which gives us 8.73 grams for our standard deviation. And the standard deviation does rely on the 10% condition. So if we really wanted to, uh, we could draw the curve. We know it's approximately normal. We said our mean was actually at 5 grams, and our standard deviation we calculated to be 8.73 grams. Okay, so we talked about sampling distributions for comparing two means, mu1 minus mu2. That is all for now. I'll see you in class.